Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Appreciate you finding a Bible this morning and opening to the book of Ruth. We'll be looking at the last half, there's only four chapters in the book of Ruth, we'll be looking at chapters three and four today, but just to give a little introduction to the book of Ruth, so we can set the context here, the book of Ruth starts out where a man by the name of Elimelech and his wife Naomi lived in Bethlehem, and there was a famine in the land, and so they went to the land of Moab that was not affected by the famine. And we don't know why, but shortly after they got there, Elimelech passed away and Naomi was left there with her two sons. And then they ended up marrying Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. And they lived there in the land of Moab about 10 years. And then for some unknown reason, both of those men died. And so Naomi was left without a husband and without her sons and with only her two daughters-in-law. And so she decided she had heard that there was food back in the land of Judah. And so she determined to go back to her homeland, to where her kin were. And initially, both of her daughters-in-law were going to go and join her and go back to her homeland and stay with her. But she persisted and said, no, I really, you need to stay with your own people. You need to get remarried. You need to go about your lives and don't worry about me. And Orpah did tearfully go back to her homeland. And Ruth, as famously recorded in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Beautiful loyalty demonstrated there. And then chapter 2 kind of sets the stage for what we're going to talk about today. So I'm just going to, there's only 23 verses, let's just read that if you want to follow along. Ruth chapter 2. Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is a Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaths. And so she came and hath continued even from the morning until now, that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. And she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldst take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been shown me, all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not, Heretofore, the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, 
and because you have spoken friendly unto your handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine, of thine handmaidens. Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And let fall also some of the handfuls on purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. She showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabitess said, He said also unto me, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. And so she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest, and dwelt with her mother-in-law. As we begin this morning with Ruth chapter 3 now, we witness the redemption of Ruth. I am convinced that Boaz's redemption of Ruth is one of the most perfect illustrations possible of Christ redeeming his people. So the word this morning is redemption. What does it mean to be redeemed? It means to be made free. The word redemption perhaps has gotten itself too much involved with a great deal of theological jargon, but it very simply means to be made free. Almost 40 years ago now, when arrangements were finally made and 52 American captives in Iran were flown out through Algeria to Germany and finally to the United States, they were redeemed. They had been taken hostage from November 4th, 1979, till January 20th, 1981, 444 days of captivity. And now they were redeemed. Before they had been hostages, treated like prisoners, and now they were honored, they were celebrated. And that's what it means to be redeemed. It means to be made free. Our message this morning, Christ redeems. I'd like to share with you four facts about redemption that we can learn from the story of Ruth. Fact number one, yielding precedes redemption. If you have your Bible open to the third chapter of the book of Ruth, Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred? with whose maidens thou wast, behold, he went with barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself, therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Ruth said, Naomi, Boaz is our kindred. Now we have to understand Jewish custom in the time of Ruth and Naomi. This word kindred was tremendously significant. You see, when God's people got over into the promised land, each family was given a plot of land. And that land was to stay in the family forever. Well, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, had had a piece of land. He would probably had to mortgage it when he left to go over to Moab, as we study in the first two chapters. 
That land needed to be brought back into the family again. And it was the responsibility of the next of kin to bring the land back into the family. That was Mosaic law number one. Law number two was called leveret, leveret marriage. The kin was supposed to marry the widow, and then when they had children, those children would inherit that original plot of land, and that is how the land would stay in the family from one generation to the next. Naomi tremendously appreciated what Ruth had done for her, but she longed for the family name and the family property to be perpetuated. This could only be done if there were offspring, and so she wanted Ruth to be fulfilled. She wanted Ruth to be secure. The only way for that to be accomplished in that society was that she needed a husband or there would be no security. She must have a child or there would be no fulfillment. Now, Naomi was an older woman, too old to marry and have children on her own. But mind you, no woman is ever too old to enjoy playing matchmaker. And so she said, now, Ruth, since you are from Moab, these customs may be kind of new to you, so let me tell you how this is going to work. Verse 3 again. Wash thyself, therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee. Bathe, perfume, your prettiest dress. Get yourself all prettied up, put on some perfume, and wait until your kin, until Boaz is all through his work for the day. He's had his supper, and he's in a good mood. She was using women's wiles. Naomi was also using her head. She knew that there was a time when Ruth would be able to find Boaz alone. You remember it was barley harvest. When the sheaves of grain were brought together, they were brought to the threshing floor, probably an area about double the size of the sanctuary, typically. Oxen would be brought in with a sled attached behind that was probably loaded with stones in order to make it very heavy. And then they would go round and round and round this threshing floor, pressing out the grain from the rest of the wheat or the barley. And then when a wind came up, they would winnow the barley. That is, they would throw it up in the air and the wind would catch all the chaff and all the light stuff and all the grain would settle back down. And then they took the grain again a final time and put it through a sieve in order to get out the last particles. And gradually this pile of barley grain would just continue to grow and grow and grow until there was an enormous pile of grain from the harvest. Now it was approaching the close of harvest and there must have been a lot of barley there. And Naomi knew that Boaz, being a prudent man, would be sleeping alongside that barley tonight. Uncover his feet, Ruth, and lay thee down. Now, folks have been kind of uncomfortable about that for a long time, but this was not an immoral affair. Immoral affairs very seldom begin or end at the feet. There are other more romantic and enticing parts of the human anatomy. It was not a romantic occasion. It was, according to Jewish custom, an actual proposal of marriage. She was offering herself as a bride to Boaz. Chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Chapter 3, 8 and 9. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thy handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. He woke up, and there she was at his feet. That must have been pretty startling. Spread your skirt, your coat, spread your robe, please, over me, Boaz. Now, this is not a very dignified posture for the contemporary woman, and I wouldn't want us to teach principles of marriage necessarily from this, but I'll tell you what this does illustrate. It's one of the most beautiful illustrations ever of the question that many people are bothered with so often. How do you come to Jesus? What do you have to do? How do you come to Jesus? Here it is, folks, right here in Ruth 3, verses 8 and 9. Two things. Number one, you fall at his feet. And number two, you ask him to cover you with the robe of his righteousness. Redemption begins with yielding. And oh, how anxious and how willing Christ is to cover. And yet how unwilling we are to fall at his feet. 
Redemption, that's when you fall at his feet and Jesus covers your imperfection with his perfection. Yielding, we all have yielded something, but dear worshiper, if we have not yielded everything, then it means next to nothing. Jesus will either be Lord of all or he will not be Lord at all. Bobby Richardson, a great second baseman for the New York Yankees, from the mid-50s to the mid-60s during one of their dynasty periods, was also very active in the fellowship of Christian athletes. And in their meeting one day, Bobby Richardson prayed a prayer that is so beautiful in its simplicity. Just ten words. He just bowed his head and he said, Dear God, your will, nothing more, Nothing less, nothing else. Amen. I invite you this morning to pray that prayer. Dear God, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Can you pray that prayer? Can you honestly say as you pray this morning that there is nothing else in this world so important, so significant, so exciting to you as that God's will be done in your life? If and when you can pray that prayer, you can know that you are redeemed. Redemption begins with our yielding. Christ redeems. Fact number two about redemption is that our Redeemer not only accepts us, he helps solve our problems. Ruth chapter 3, verses 11 to 13. Ruth 3, 11 to 13. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, will let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then I will do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth. Lie down until the morning. With all of her matchmaking, Naomi, having been gone for ten years, made one apparent mistake. She picked the wrong man. There was another relative who was more closely related to Ruth, Naomi, and Elimelech than was Boaz. Boaz was very much aware of this. Early the next morning, Ruth rushed home, verse 18. Then said she, that is Naomi speaking, after Ruth had told her the whole story of what had happened. Naomi said, sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he hath finished the thing this day. Oh, what beautiful counsel to someone who is being redeemed. Sit still, Ruth. Don't worry. Don't fuss. Don't fume. Don't stress. The man will not be in rest. You now have someone who is accepting your case for you. Sit still and rest. Ruth had had a heavy responsibility, caring for Naomi, no way to provide for herself, no husband, no heir, no visible future. But when the case had been taken to Boaz, Ruth was then at peace. And I know that some in this congregation have brought today a very heavy load, problems to which you know no answer. But if you will bring your burden to the Lord and leave it there, there is no longer anything to fear. There is no need to worry. You are not fighting alone. God has taken your case for you. President Abraham Lincoln was pacing the floor in the White House during the early hours of the battle at Gettysburg. The fate of the Union very possibly was to be settled at Gettysburg. Reports kept coming in as he paced the floor. Everyone was anxious and upset. Finally, Lincoln excused himself, and he went alone into his own room. And he knelt down there, and he put his head in his hands, and he poured out his heart in prayer. He told the story to a friend later. He said, I prayed something like this. I've done all I could, God. It is in your hands. 
And if the union is to be preserved, it is because you want it so. And then, said Lincoln, an enormous burden rolled off his shoulders and peace finally came. If you have brought to worship this morning some burden, I covet for you that experience. Lord, I have done what I could. It is now in your hands. I trust you. Let the burdens roll away. The Redeemer not only accepts us, he helps us solve our problems. Christ redeems. Fact number three. Our Redeemer is interested in us. The world is interested in what it can get from us. First thing next morning, Boaz went to work. He left the field and he went up to the gate of the city. That's where the legal transactions occurred in the day. And he called to jury ten elders of the city. They met together there at the gate to Bethlehem. And Boaz spoke then to the kinsmen. We'll read what he had to say there in chapter 4 now. Verses 3 and 4. And then negotiation begins. Ruth chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And he said unto the kinsmen, Naomi, that has come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. The kinsman was immediately interested. To buy back the land? Yes, I will redeem it. He was beginning apparently to see dollar signs in front of his eyes. And the nearest of kin had first right to the property and to a family line that apparently was dying out. He didn't mind at all being the redeemer so long as he could get a $10,000 piece of property for $5,000. But Boaz isn't through. There's just this little encumbrance, says Boaz. We'll read that in chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Then said Boaz, what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi... Thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now exactly what his argument is, we're not absolutely certain. He says, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Probably it was something like this. Oh, that's different. If I have to marry Ruth, now it wasn't that Ruth wasn't desirable. But he says, if I have to marry Ruth, then she will want children and the land will go then to them. And it's then no advantage to me. Besides, I don't want to mess up my family tree with Moabite blood. And all of a sudden it was impossible for him to be involved because he was interested only in profit. But Boaz was interested in Ruth. Verse 10. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. And they had a peculiar custom. The first kinsman took off his shoe and handed it to Boaz. And Boaz held up the shoe before the whole audience, and especially the jury of ten. He said, you now bear witness that this man has passed up his rights to redeem, and I now proudly and publicly take Ruth as my bride. Oh, what a difference in interest for Ruth. All that the kinsman was interested in was the prophet, but Boaz was interested in Ruth. Now the kinsman represents Satan. After all, you know, he is our next of kin. We're more like him, you know, than we are like God. Boaz represents Christ. The kinsman wanted to be involved in the life of Ruth and Naomi so long as he could get something out of them. Boaz wanted to get involved because he cared about them. Satan, dear friend, wants what you have. 
Only Christ wants what you are. The world holds before you the most glittering of enticements, but once it has robbed you of your youth and sucked from you your virtue, it will throw you on the scrap heap without a second thought. Because the world doesn't care a bit about you, it cares about what you can do for it. And as long as you have something to offer, the world is interested. Only Christ, though, cares about you, and that is why Christ redeems. Fact number four. Offspring proves our redemption. Chapter four and verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. The natural product of the relationship between Ruth and Boaz was baby Obed, who was the grandfather of David. The natural product of the relationship between Christ and the sinner is newborn Christians. If there had been no Obed, if there had been no baby, we would wonder if the relationship had been a full and a natural one. And if there are no newborn Christians as a result of your relationship with Christ, you must ask yourself this morning if your relationship with Jesus Christ has been a full and a natural one. Ruth and Naomi came to Bethlehem feeling themselves failures. They used that horrible Jewish word barren. They were unfulfilled. They hadn't done what a Jewish woman was supposed to do. They were considered cursed. The church that produces no inheritance, no heritage, no children, no new Christians is barren. It is unfulfilled. It is not doing what a church is meant to do. The church is a lighthouse. The purpose of a lighthouse is to shed light. Now, to have a lighthouse, you have to have a building. In order to have a lighthouse, you've got to have a certain amount of machinery. But the lighthouse does not exist for the building or for the machinery. It's an interesting place to bring tourists, but that is not what a lighthouse is for. The church is a lighthouse. We need a building. A building that is respectable is physical proof of how much we love our God. But the purpose of the church is not the building. The purpose of the church is not the machinery, the planning, the organization, the committees. The purpose of the church is the shedding of light and the bearing of offspring. There's a story that comes from the Alps. There was a man caught out in a winter storm. He stumbled along half frozen, finally fell unconscious. A rescue dog came. St. Bernard found him there in the snow. Great, giant animal. He crawled upon the chest of the man and let his warmth revive the frozen man. And as his body began to warm, half in stupor, only half conscious, he opened his eyes and he saw this huge animal upon him. And in his panic, in his desperation, he thrust his knife into the side of the dog. Who began to crawl fatally wounded toward the ranger station where he died. But the ranger was able to follow the trail of blood back to the man who had killed his savior. Today the Lord Jesus stands over you, wanting to revive you, to bring warmth into your life and your experience. He has already died for your sins. He has already paid the ultimate price. He has shed his blood for you. But unless you choose him, he cannot redeem you. Today, fall at his feet. Ask him to cover you with the robe of his righteousness. Trust him to solve your problems. Jesus cares about you.
how beautiful it would be if every worshiper could go away from this place of worship today singing redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Shall we pray? Our dear loving Father in heaven, we're just so, just so in awe of you, our great Redeemer God, who loves us sinners so much that you gave your life for us. Lord, we thank you today for redeeming us. If there's anyone in this congregation today that doesn't feel redeemed, Lord, I pray they will not leave this building until they get a sense of your redemptive power. That you will cover us with the robe of your righteousness, that it doesn't matter what we've done, what our history is, what sins bog us down and keep coming back to bog us down. All we have to do is come to Jesus right now and let you cover our sinfulness with the robe of your righteousness. Lord, help each one here to accept again or maybe for the first time your redeeming love for us. Because we know, Lord, as we've seen in this story of Ruth, this beautiful story of your redemptive power, we've seen that you care about us, that you will take care of our problems and that we can trust you to leave them at your feet and know that you have taken on our tasks and that you will perform miracles in our lives if we will only give them to you. And so, Lord, I pray that each one here will accept your redeeming love today and that each day we can go forward to draw closer and closer to you, that we can be more and more like Jesus and that we can be individually in our homes, in our community, in this church, that we can be the lighthouse that can bear offspring, that can bear fruit, that we can lift up Jesus in our homes, in our community, in this church, that we can lift up Jesus so that others can be led to the foot of the cross. Is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen.